magic. I think we're on. Good morning. Magic is as mysterious as mathematics, as empirical as poetry, as uncertain as golf, and as dependent on per the personal equation as love. That's a quote from Aleister Crowley. Uh, this morning, for various reasons, <laughs> I've, I've decided to uh, uh, share uh, seven questions about Goetia uh, evocation. Uh, and I'm taking it from uh, uh, material that I wrote uh, for the the book, The Key to Solomon's Key, which is really kind of two books uh, in one, uh, and they sort of segue into uh, to one another. Uh, the second section of it is, is sort of a handbook of Goetia key vocation or Solomonic magic. Uh, and the first section is uh, about uh, uh, the Knights Templar and uh, the connection with, uh, or the fabled connection between Freemasonry and, and uh, the Knights Templar. And the segue is that the Knights Templar uh, were accused of uh, various uh, things in their, uh, when they got themselves busted after 200 years. Uh, one of the accusations was that of sorcery. And um, so the, uh, that, was, that was sort of the segue. But the second half is sort of a handbook of uh, Solomonic magic or, or, uh, or Goetia. Uh, it's not meant to be a replacement of uh, the classic texts of the Megaton. Uh, but it would, uh, if you're familiar with those texts, it would serve as a as sort of a desert island, uh, all in one manual containing all the spirits and the conjurations and things like that. Uh, but uh, in my introduction to that section, I, I've got uh, seven, seven questions uh, that... Uh, that I try to preemptively answer uh, for the rational person that might <laughs> might want to uh, at least explore the idea of, uh, of uh, Goetia's evocation as a legitimate magical meditational uh, and uh, uh, spiritual exercise. So I'm going to share that with you this morning. Question number one that I'll try to answer is, do you actually expect me to believe this kind of magic works? No. I don't expect anyone to believe anything. Magic is a psychological art form, not a belief system. Unless, of course, you consider the concept of cause and effect to be a belief system. I'm expecting, however, that you will withhold absolute judgment about the efficacy of such practices until such time as you actually perform a Goetia evocation for yourself. I have on numerous occasions over the last 30 years, so well, it was 30 years when I wrote this, uh, evoked a number of spirits of the Goetia utilizing the basic formula outs outlined in the Lesser Key of Solomon. I have also taught others to do the same. If success is measured by whether or not the stated purpose of the exercise was regularly achieved, then my personal experience and reports from others with whom I've had personal contact lead me to affirm categorically that this kind of magic does indeed work. Question two, are the spirits real or imaginary? And this is where 
people instantly jump to misinterpret by what I think are very clear words when I when I uh, uh, talk about the objectiveness or subjectiveness of uh, the the spirits. All I'm saying is that there is no difference between objective and subjectiveness in the consciousness level of the magician. So in other words, there is no such thing. There is no difference between objectiveness and subjectiveness when it comes to the quantum environment of magic. But that's not what I say here. Okay, I'll, okay. Question two. Are the spirits real or imaginary? I can only offer my personal opinion based on conclusions I've drawn as a result of my own experiences with this kind of exercise. There are many very knowledgeable individuals who disagree with my assumptions. Some think I've taken all the magic out of magic by overanalyzing the process and making things too psychological. Others think my view of the art aren't agnostic enough and that my views are naive and overly mystical and romantic. I offer no rebuttal to either of these charges other than to say spirits are as real as the powers they personify. To quote my literary alter ego, Rabbi Lamed Ben Clifford, peace be on him, the spirits are both real and imaginary, but most of us do not real ha realize how real our imagination is. For example, I don't believe in the existence of an objective, tangible, tangible entity who lives at the North Pole and flies around the world on Christmas Eve delivering gifts to everyone. But I know for a fact that there is a real magical spirit of mad generosity personified merrily in the minds of billions of people as Santa Claus. In fact, each year during the months when this spirit is at its zenith, of power to possess people, this subjective intangible spirit is in a very real way responsible for the manifestation of an unimaginable number of material objects and immeasurable wealth and happiness. But beware. The same letters that spell Santa also spell Satan. This spirit also has a dark and evil side. When not properly understood, evoked and controlled, he can be a cynical and destructive demon who during his icy season routinely brings gifts of family strife suffocating debt, regret, depression, and suicide. There are those who agree with the great 20th century magician, Aleister Crowley, who wrote in his introduction to Goetia that, quote, the spirits of the Goetia are portions of the human brain, unquote. Well, I'm not sure I altogether agree Mr. Crowley certainly provides us with food for thought. How often have we heard that humans actually use only a tiny portion of our brains? Who knows what godlike powers we could exercise if we use more of our brains? Imagine that we could divide that unused part of the brain into 72 sections, the 72, the 72 spirits of the Goetia. Each section is a living representative of a specific and unique psychic or intellectual power we presently are not using. The attributes or powers of the spirit. We assign each of these sections a mythological name, 
Fur Fur or Orobas and a symbol, a seal. There's our good friend Andromalius. That we can gaze upon during altered states of consciousness induced by rituals of preparation, the incense, the babbling strings of incomprehensible words, whereby we isolate, activate, and employ that portion of the brain. Instead of thinking of the spirits as portions of the physical brain tissue, however, it might be more accurate and just as practical to view them as portions of the subconscious mind. As pioneers of quantum physics are suggesting and demonstrating, the influence of the mind transcends the tiny confines of the human cranium and operate on multiple dimensions unencumbered by limits of space and time. Tinkering with the subconscious mind is in a very real way tinkering with the cosmos. And since prehistoric times, the people who've t tinkered with their subconscious minds the most have been called magicians. Question three. The text say, or the text says that many of the spirits have very odd and archaic powers. <laughs> Duh. That I have absolutely no interest in. If the spirits are merely portions of my brain or mind, why on earth would I have a section dedicated to fetching horses or attaining prelacies or lighting seeming candles upon the graves of the dead. It'll become immediately obvious to the reader that the text is written in an odd and archaic style. There is a simple reason for this. It is an odd and archaic document. As I mentioned in chapter 11, the original manuscripts date from 1697 and represent updated versions of far older material. Even though the world has changed a lot since then, our daily lives are in essence remarkably similar to our ancestors. We may not have the need of horses or church honors or the power of illuminating graves, but we still need a car, career advancement, and some of us occasionally need the wit and eloquence to write and deliver a eulogy. Selecting the proper spirit to perform the specific tasks you need is a vital component of the magical operation. Some are very obvious, as in the case in number 10, Buer, who is said to healeth all distempers. Others are not so obvious and take a little thought and imagination. But being able to recognize your particular problem metaphorically expressed as the power to understand birds or causing trees to bend at your will is the first step to impressing your subconscious mind with the essence of the issue you need resolved. A bird needn't be a crow or a canary. It could be a chattering gossip or a biology test. The power to bend a tree may suggest the ability to overcome stiff, stiff resistance to your idea or proposals. Question four. In the first section of this book, you spent a lot of time demonstrating that the Old Testament patriarchs, David, Solomon, and others were not historical characters. Yet the lesser key of Solomon is filled with references to these characters. Are you asking us to again believe in fables? Yes and no. 
Of course, these Bible characters and stories are myths and fables, but myths and fables come from and profoundly affect the deepest strata of the human psyche. Most of us are happy to suspend our disbelief for a few hours within the dark confines of a movie theater. That same imaginative ability is the cornerstone of magic, a powerful tool that most of us use only for sex, entertainment, and diversion. If used with skill and understanding, however, it's the perfect tool to help us break out of our present narrow stream of consciousness. Recall from chapter 11 that I ask you to view these operations not as a magical ceremony, but as psycho a psychological exercise, a psychodrama, whereby we call forth and isolate previously uncontrolled potentialities within ourselves and redirect their heretofore chaotic energies. The medieval magicians didn't think in psychological terms at all. He or she believed quite passionately in the Old Testament God under a host of names and the supernatural powers of the biblical patriarchs David and Solomon. In a way, this gave the ancient practitioners a decided advantage over the modern practitioner who must either a like a true method actor or a participant in a role-playing game find a way to temporarily step out of the rational flow of consciousness into the classical magical world with its existing rules and characters or b somehow create comparable magical world with a mythological hierarchy that personifies his or her understanding and beliefs. Both categories can be equally effective. I personally know of several Solomonic magicians, including the great master, Goetic, uh, master of Goetic evocation, Polk Runyon, who wholeheartedly embrace the art form of the classic Goetic workings. They operate by the book and as much as humanly possible conform with every instruction found in the text. They wear the proper attire, construct and use the proper magical tools and equipment, observe the proper hours, memorize all the conjurations and constraints, everything. And if you've ever seen Poke operate, it's awesome. But I digress. It offends their sense of art. And after all, magic is an art. It offends their sense of art if the instructions in the classical texts are violated. It bolsters their magical confidence to know in their hearts they are doing the things just like the ancient practitioners. Doing this is the yoga and the Zen of their art. Personally, I fall more easily into category B. My sense of art is not at all offended by amending or discarding portions of the classic text. And while I take pains to conform to the basic formula and follow the order of ceremony of the classic system, I've customized everything else to harmonize with my own spiritual worldview. With a little thought, anyone else can do the same. Question number five. Under what circumstances is it appropriate to evoke a spirit? Ultimately, the only ma individual magician can determine when it is is or is not appropriate to use Solomonic magic to evoke a spirit. However, my experience of what has and has not worked for me in the past leads me to make the following observations. First, you must have a problem, a real problem. 
But before enlisting the aid of a spirit to resolve the problem, you must have done everything in your power to take care of the matter by regular means on the physical plane. That's magic too. If your neighbor's thoughtless midnight tuba plane is ruining your sleep, your health, or your ability to stay awake at work, if you've asked him to stop, if you've called the police and they didn't help, if you've tried to enlist the help of other neighbors, if you've marched next door and punched the inconsiderate idiot in his tuba-tooting lip, if you've tried everything else right here on earth, then maybe it's time to at least consider a magical remedy. However, if you haven't exhausted all other measures, it would be cowardly and unwise to magically tinker with your precious subconscious mind just to force some poor spirit to do your dirty work. Secondly, the problem you wish to resolve must be a personal matter. This is my opinion, everyone. You can't do magic for someone else. When you formally evoke a spirit, you are evoking an adventure. Adventures are not always pleasant and sometimes are dangerous, even deadly. At the conclusion of the adventure, however, if you survive, you'll emerge from the experience a better, wiser, braver, cooler person. No one else can take your adventure for you. And you cannot take the adventure for someone else. Therefore, your reason for evoking a spirit must be entirely personal. You wouldn't expect to reap the benefits of psychotherapy by sending someone else to replace you on the analyst's couch. Thirdly, you must feel totally justified in doing what you are about to do. You must have a deep emotional involvement in the matter you wish resolved. If you aren't convinced of your motive, if you're not reaching to the very bottom of the visceral hell of your frustration, your anger, then you're not touching the level of consciousness where these beasties reside. Moreover, once you've evoked it into the triangle, you must be able to consider the spirit the personification of your problem. For in essence, that's what it is. You have every reason to be mad at it. The spirit is your problem. It's always been your problem. For the first time in your life, you've isolated it and can now focus the full force of your righteous anger and indignation not at your spouse, not at your boss, not at your kid, not at your dog or the government, but the real source of your problem. It has to listen to you. So you better know what you want to tell it. It's either going to shape up and do what you command or you are going to annihilate it. My last little word of advice is don't make deals with the spirit. In a very real way, you've been unconsciously making deals with the spirit your whole life. That's why you've got your problem. 
The whole ceremony is your formal way of branding your subconscious mind with the idea that you are through making deals with this tangled piece of ignorance, flawed perception, fear, vice, or addiction. Take your pick. They're all demons. Do you see the plot of this psychodrama? Do you see the method to the madness? Once you voluntarily reprogrammed your subconscious mind with the traumatic little experience like this, you become in essence a different person. Different things start happening to you when you become a different person. If all goes well, one of those things will be the solution to your problem. Question number six. All these lengthy and verbose conjurations, constraints, and curses, do I have to memorize and recite them? What purpose do they serve? <coughs> Obviously, in order to get yourself in a place where the idea of talking to a spirit seems like a perfectly normal thing to do, you must be in an altered state of consciousness. There are lots of ways to induce all altered states of consciousness, including the use of psychoactive chemicals, plants, and herbs. While these substances have always had their place in the mystical life of human beings. To the disappointment of many, they do not mix well with this kind of magic. The problem stems from the fact that while it's very easy to induce an altered state of consciousness by ingesting drugs, it's difficult, if not impossible, to return to objective consciousness at the price, precise moment in the ceremony when it's vitally important that you do so. This can be very, a very dangerous situation in which to find oneself. The traditional methods may be less colorful and glamorous. And I mean glamorous in the most magical sense of the term. But they're safer and far more predictable than drugs. In the same way, the modern devotee of transcendental meditation repeats a mantra in order to step out of the stream of everyday consciousness. The ancient magicians used modern and the modern Solomonic purist, memorized and recited page upon page of conjurations filled with strings of strange sounding names and magical words. Curiously, these words don't necessarily have to mean anything. In fact, the more corrupt and meaningless the words are, the more effective they are in triggering the desired effect upon the magician's consciousness. Eventually, the tedium, even the absurdity of what one is doing, causes the mind to rebel and slip into the desired space. In my opinion, the modern magician is better served by composing his or her own customized conjuration or conjurations. For me, it's unduly distracting to engage in name dropping of biblical characters I know never existed in deities that I don't worship. In either case, the most important element of the conjuration come at the very beginning where the magician, like the legendary Solomon, affirms his or her connection to the supreme deity. This is the moment when we consciously insert ourselves in the spiritual hierarchy of the cosmos. Question number seven. In answer to question three, you said that you conform to the basic formula and follow the order of ceremony of the classic system. Can you outline the basic formula and order of operation? 
And my answer is yes. And I go ahead and do that in the next few pages. And it's those next few pages that we'll pick it up tomorrow with your permission. Anyway, I hope you're enjoying this. I'm having a good time. Okay. Anyway, until tomorrow, continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other. Now, Constance is out on her bicycle at the drugstore getting her second booster shot at the moment. I hope she's okay. Otherwise, she would answer when I say, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will.